Going to space is surprisingly more dependent on geography than you may first expect. The best way to go to space is by taking advantage of Earth's rotational speed so you can save up some fuel. That means the best place to launch is close to the equator where Earth's rotational speed is at its maximum. Since our planet rotates west to east, it's best to launch rockets into the east. And since things can go wrong during a launch and the rocket may fall out of the sky or because rockets may have stages to drop, it would be ideal to have a lot of empty space east of where you are launching from. The geography of going to space begins on Earth and the geopolitics of space will revolve around who controls the ability to launch into space. The Americans launch from Florida. It is close to the equator and if something is dropped or goes wrong, it goes straight into the Atlantic. America has even more options available. For future space programs, Hawaii, or should they become states, Guam and Puerto Rico, would be even better launching sites than Florida. The United States is in the unique position of having multiple perfect places from which they could launch into space completely undisturbed. Adding to that is a society that has the resources to go to space. The Americans will therefore continue to be this planet's major player in space and will probably dominate the space sector for decades to come. The Europeans are largely screwed in the geography of space. Not only are they distant from the equator, but anything they launch and would fail or drop would come down over Russia. Now some of you may not care much about the well-being of Russia, but it also means that Russia could shoot down anything launched from Europe. Therefore, European rockets are launched from the French overseas territory of French Guiana in South America. If French Guiana would ever become independent in the future, European ambitions for an independent space program would be kind of screwed. Europe would then have to go ask others to launch their rockets for them or build a completely new spaceport, for which the Portuguese islands, called the Azores, would be the best alternative location. Europe was late to developing space programs, and for decades each country pursued its own goals with limited resources. In 1975 the European Space Agency was founded, and by now Europeans learned that they have a better chance at going to space when they work together. If there is to be a European future in space, Europe will have to continue working together. Europe is largely still catching up to others, especially in launch capabilities, although they are real good in satellites and deep space research. And for the time being, Europe has hitched itself to working with NASA in the hope of learning from the Americans. When there is talk of a coming space race, it is often framed in the old Cold War terms with the Americans and the Soviets. But that is largely untrue. Russia is on a decline from space. Russia was the pioneer in space. It sent the first satellites to space, the first human beings, and the first space stations. Russia used to sell rocket engines to the West, because the Soviets were the first to figure out rocket propulsion for space travel, mainly through their genius chief rocket engineer Sergei Korolev. But when Korolev died in 1966, the Soviet space program stagnated and declined from here on, unable to produce such a genius and his innovations again. Rocket propulsion may have been a great innovation in the 1950s and 1960s, and while it is still a big deal, it isn't that much of a big deal today anymore. Billionaires can hire engineers to do it. In fact, you can watch Taiwanese nerds build rocket propulsion systems with 3D printers here on YouTube. Those may be small in scale, but who knows where those nerds will be in a few years. What will hurt Russian space ambitions the most is isolationism. The Russians ended partnerships with Europe and America, and an American, European and East Asian ban on selling semiconductors and laser technology to Russia is destined to put its space program on a decline. Because as much as Taiwan right now cannot into space, when Russia tells her she can into China, Taiwan will remind Russia that Russia cannot into semiconductors. Bottom line here is, if you want to be a leader in space to Today, those who sell semiconductors are more important than those who sell rocket propulsion systems. Meaning, if you want to go to space, good relations to Taiwan and the Netherlands are more important than with Russia. Russia still has one great thing going for them. The Baikonur spaceport is one of the best launch sites in the world. Something the Russians seem to have forgotten though is that it is in Kazakhstan. And after recently being proven unable to force their will onto other countries, Russia has realized that its space program is dependent on Kazakh goodwill. Space travel has changed dramatically since the Cold War. It is no longer just a matter of scientific and national prestige. Modern space travel is an intricate network of international cooperation between science institutes, public sector, private corporations and market interests from multiple countries across the entire globe. Close to nobody goes to space alone anymore. Going to space today means working together with others. The Russians massively shot themselves in the foot. They will not be one of the main competitors in a future space race. 
China is one of the co-founders of the Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, founded in 2005. Unlike the Russians, the Chinese correctly understood the challenges of modern space travel, primarily that walking it alone is undesirable and that cooperation is desirable. The Chinese like to promote their space program as a fundamentally collaborative effort for the benefit of all of Asia, just under Chinese leadership. This is smart. The West may at some point put restrictions on the export of semiconductors and laser technology to China, but can it do the same for the rest? By formulating their space program as international in its mission, China has protected their ambitions in space, but also unintentionally damaged them. China's current priorities are to get a man on the moon and to expand its satellite navigation system Baidu as a competitor to the American GPS. But Iran, who is part of the organization, prioritizes military satellites and rockets that can come back down to Earth over Israel, which annoys China. Pakistan also pursues military goals in its space program, which would offer potential for cooperation with Iran. But Pakistan's rocket program targets Iran's friend India, which makes Iran unhappy, but China happy. You see the problem? What's the point of having partners when you can't agree with them? The clearly implied Chinese leadership has also increasingly made partners like Thailand uneasy. China made an organization without clearly defining its goals, and for her neighbors, all it did was incentivize them to work harder on their own space programs. What one should also not forget is that China's space program is plagued with many failures, the most recent in 2021. Unable to develop things such as high-end semiconductors that Taiwan has, it has only been since 2019 that China subsidized the creation of private companies in the space industry and shared a few of its state secret rocket technologies with those. Whether this will improve on the Chinese space program is yet to be seen. To India and Japan, China's Asia-Pacific Space Organization is primarily seen as one thing, a threat especially to India. From their perspective, this organization almost looks like a belt intended to surround her. Consequently, this Chinese initiative did more good for the Indian space program than it did for the Chinese space program, because India was motivated into gearing up its space program. There may have been some initial problems and some failures, but it is today very clear that India is catching up very fast with its Chinese rival. In fact, India recently became the fourth country to land on the moon. And just a quick look at the news coverage will show you the politics at play. I can see on ground news that more than 300 sources from around the world reported on this story and the coverage is pretty evenly distributed across the political spectrum. But if I scroll down, I can compare every single article on the topic with convenient tags showing me context about the source, like how reliable it is and who owns it. This US-based source on the left suggests India is joining an elite club. But beyond the left-right political spectrum, what I really like to see is the difference in how nations report on the same events. For example, this source, based out of New Delhi, emphasizes the fact that India is the first nation to land near the moon's south pole. And other than the South China Morning Post, which is based out of Hong Kong, there are no major Chinese news sources reporting on this development. Sometimes, not saying anything says a lot. Ground News has been a reliable companion in my research endeavors for videos like this. It ensures that I stay updated on a myriad of topics, thanks to the worldwide selection of sources. Their mission aligns with much of what I do here, diving deeply into issues, providing context, and promoting informed discussions. It's especially useful right now as the world grapples with the events in Israel and Palestine. You can sign up for as little as $1 per month or subscribe through my link ground.news crowd to get 30% off unlimited access. By subscribing, you actively support the content we create here. A big thank you to Ground News for supporting my channel. India is also already blessed by something China lacks, the perfect geography for going to space. India's spaceports are all in the south, as close to the equator as possible, and charge into space over the Indian Ocean. India also has something else, an education sector built on initiative and innovation and transparency and creativity, rather than the ideologically mandated drill schools of China. And India can also rely on an innovative private sector and a large pool of highly educated Indian expats, giving India the educational edge. India is about to send a man to space in 2024. Its space program shows enormous promise. Japan also was pushed into greater action by China. But Japan focuses on civilian sectors, navigation, environmental protection, surveillance and communication. It is astonishing how little we hear in the West of the Japanese space program in our news because it is very impressive. 
The Japanese just happened to be very humble about it. In existence since the 1950s, even though they never sent a man into space, Japan was never far behind the United States when it comes to satellite and rocket technology. Japan has a geographically great spaceport in Tangeshima and Japan has conducted many successful launches. And besides a great geography for space, Japan also owns two other things needed for space, a lot of money and a lot of very big brains. Popular news media likes to sometimes raise the specter of a looming space race between China and the United States, which is really not the case. It is more appropriate to speak of an Asian space race, where the threat of China has pushed India and Japan to work together, and the rest of Asia will be picking sides between those two teams. By the standards of geography, it is ironically none of the countries who we consider to be big in space travel who have the best geography for space travel. It's Brazil, Venezuela, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, India, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea and Australia. These countries have the ideal geographies for getting to space, but they also prove that geography is not everything. Venezuela has the geography for space, but it has neither the money or functioning institutions for space. Venezuelan satellites are built and launched from China. Somalia has far more pressing issues, and so does Sri Lanka. Kenya has the best geography for launching into space in the world, but rather than developing its own space program, they wish to sell launching sites to others. Africans know that throughout their history, whenever non-Africans wanted what Africans had, they came to take it by force. African ambitions are set on taking advantage of their own opportunities before anyone else can, but African states have a lot more challenges to settle on Earth before space is reachable as a frontier. So it is worth keeping in mind that African countries could also be set to lose. Australia, Indonesia and the Philippines largely neglected their beneficial space geography. The Philippines relied on the Chinese to launch satellites, the Indonesians and Australians on the Americans. But in recent years, with more interest in space, all of them are now more intensely exploring the ideas of their own space programs. If they leased their geography out, built their own programs or continue to neglect it is yet to be seen. One thing to watch with all of them is with who they choose to work together in going to space. The only countries who have a great geography for space and take full advantage of it are the aforementioned India and Brazil has an unfortunate nickname among political scientists, the forever next superpower, that for 200 years is just a few years away from being South America's superpower. Brazil, like India, not only has the perfect geography for going to space, but also has a pretty decent space program. What is more impressive is that Brazil managed to develop this space program despite the Americans opposing it. The Americans blockaded the sale of rocket technology to Brazil since the 1980s when Brazil managed to make its space program increasingly independent from the United States. In return, Brazil worked increasingly with China on developing her space program. The Americans increasingly began seeing Brazil as one of its main competitors, mainly because Brazil's launch site was geographically better and cheaper. The Americans also worried that if American companies began sending rockets to be launched from Brazil, the Brazilians would steal American technology and sell it. So, Americans were banned from launching rockets in Brazil. But despite these American measures, the Brazilian space program persevered. The American boycott of the Brazilian space program eventually ended in 2019. But before you cheer for the plucky yet successful Brazilian space program, you should know that it also has its own dark history. The launch site was built on Quilombolas. The Quilombolas are runaway African slaves who fled the Brazilian slave plantations into the isolated regions of northern Brazil, where far away from the plantations and their owners, they built farms and constructed communities. In 1982, the Brazilian military dictatorship bulldozed the Quilombola farms of Alcantara and chased away the 300 Afro-Brazilian farmers and fishermen who lived there to build the Brazilian Space Launching Center. This is a really well-hidden historical fact. You will not find it on the Wikipedia page of the Brazilian Space Center, and the only reason I know this is because at university, my professor for Latin American history gave it as an example when teaching us about the legacies of slavery in Brazil. And this very down-to-earth social issue lies at the core of what may limit and inhibit the Brazil space program in the future. In 2019, Bolsonaro agreed to expanding the space center, but that expansion plan would have meant taking the land of up to a thousand Quilombola families and destroying 600 Quilombola villages. 
Northern Brazil is an ideal location for going to space. With the American boycott gone, private companies and governments are lining up to do launches. Brazil could become the South American center for space travel. Northern Brazil has historically been the poorest part of Brazil and still continues to be. The majority of the northern population is Afro-Brazilian and is also where you will find the Quilombolas. So having this infrastructure there would benefit the region. But, obviously, just bulldozing towns into the ground and chasing away their peoples is something that a democratic and free Brazil should not do. So before Brazil can proceed further into space, it will probably have to enter negotiations with locals over recompensation to expand their space center to not repeat the mistakes of the 1980s. At the end of this video, I want to shout out Ravignon. He is a YouTuber who's been featured on this channel before. You might recognize his work in the thumbnail of the Neutrality in Europe of the 2022 video, or collab on how Christianity destroyed the tribal family, and some other slides on this channel, including within this video. Ravignon is working on a long format Poland Ball documentary series on the history of Quebec, and that series just released its third part. If you're looking for another in depth, long look at a society and its history, like with my series on Turkey and Mexico, then you'll love to watch Ravignon's project on Quebec. I'll leave a link in the description below to the third episode and I hope you can support his channel as well. Thank you for watching. See you all soon.